welcome everyone. Uh, this is the New Haven Free Public Library's book sandwiched in um, author interview series. Um, I'm Haley Grunlow. I'm a library technical assistant from the Mitchell Library, um, the branch in Westville neighborhood of New Haven. Um, and I'm here with my colleague Rory Mordorana. Um, she's an adult services and reference librarian at the Ives branch of the library. Um, and we are so excited today to uh, talk to Jake Halpern. Um, Jake is a journalist and an author of quite a few books, uh, both fiction and nonfiction. Um, and he teaches writing at Yale University here in New Haven. Um, and in 2018, he was the winner of the Pulitzer Prize um, for his graphic novel, uh, Welcome to the New World, which at the time was uh, being serialized as like a comic strip in the New York Times um, and is now collected into this beautiful uh, graphic novel. Um, well, Jake, would you like to start out by talking a little bit about like how this project came about um, sure. and how you started working on it? So uh, this project came about in a, in a kind of random way. It, I, you have to understand, I'm a, I'm a freelance journalist, so I earn my bread and butter by constantly pitching story ideas, most of which don't work out. And um, this goes, this, the, story, the story of the story, the start of it um, goes back to 2016. Uh, the backdrop was um, the US presidential uh, campaign, the one between Hillary and, and Donald Trump. And I had a story uh, that I was in, interested in doing about a family of Syrian refugees who was supposed to settle in uh, Indiana and then Governor Pence said that he would not let them settle in Indiana. It was a mother, uh, father and young daughter. Uh, presumably they were too much of a threat to the people of Indiana, but um, the governor of Connecticut said, hey, you can settle here and they ended up um, in New Haven. Um, and so I thought I would maybe write a story about them. I pitched it to an editor at the time and they said, uh, I'll never forget it because I actually wrote the pitch from the soccer field. I was watching my kid play New Haven Youth Soccer. And I wrote, sometimes you have to pitch things before you let yourself be talked out of it. That's my, my even, because <laughs> you always find a reason why you think it's a bad idea. Anyway, it was rejected. They said no, but the editor said, I've got another idea that may interest you. Um, we are thinking about doing a graphic narrative series, like a true comic that follows the life of a refugee family, ideally refugee kids, maybe coming from Syria, would you be interested? And I said, sure, uh, but I don't draw. <laughs> Small problem that is, it's like a taxi driver who doesn't drive. Uh, how can you do a graphic narrative? And they said, no, 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 we know you don't draw you'll find an artist, you would be the person that reports the story and did the nonfiction storytelling and then you will, we'd pair you up with an artist. Um, and I said, yeah, I, 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 that sounds cool. Um, I think actually one of the challenging challenges in telling refugee stories is that people get tired of them. So the idea of doing a comic just seemed like maybe a, another way to engage people. So I called up uh, Chris George, who I knew, who runs IRIS, our local refugee resettlement agency. And I said, Chris, do you think that you know a family that might be willing to be the subject of this series? You know, a lot of nonfiction, it, it works like, I think of it like Hollywood where you have to cast about for your star to, to be the, in the narrative. And nonfiction works the same way. You have to find the right person that wants to sit there for all these interviews and who has a story to tell. And, um, and Chris had this really interesting idea. He said, yeah, look, Jake, we could find someone who's already in New Haven, but why don't we possibly find a family that's about to arrive and you can be there when they arrive and you can follow them from the day they land on American soil, which I thought was a really cool idea, although it, it raised this issue of consent, which was that like, they may not want me following them around. Um, and they're also refugees, which is a kind of vulnerable population that uh, could easily be exploited. So we had to come up with a, a kind of solution. And our solution was is that 
he would find a family. I would be there when they arrived. I'd witness the arrival. And then a week or so later, I would circle back and talk to the family and see if they were game to have me follow them around. And if they were, I'd proceed. And if not, we would just do the same thing again um, until I found a family that would do it. Anyway, he calls me up and says, Jake, I've got a family that's arriving on election day. This is election day, 2016. Uh, two brothers and their respective families. What do you think? And I said, yeah, cool. Um, now, of course, initially, uh, Hillary was 92% chance guaranteed to win that election. So election day did not seem like it was gonna be a particularly uh, dramatic or nail biting of an event, but we all know how well the New York Times and everyone else got that prediction. Um, anyway, I showed up at the, the night of the, their arrival. They, they got out of this bus. We kind of said a quick hello. Um, they were tired, um, kind of overwhelmed by the journey. Um, you know, I kind of just introduced myself very briefly. My, I had found an illustrator by then, a guy named Michael Sloan, who's another New Haven resident. And we kind of waved goodbye and I went home. And I remember I checked my phone in the car it was probably about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. And already the returns were indicating that this was gonna be a much closer race than it was supposed to be. And then I woke up around 2.30 in the morning and checked the news again. And I will never forget that headline, Trump triumphs. And the kind of unthinkable had happened that this guy that was not even supposed to, you know, win the, the Republican nomination had just become president. And for anyone that had followed kind of matters involving immigrants and refugees, this was going to be a game changer. And my first thought went to this family and I kind of thought, oh my gosh, they have basically landed in one country and they're going to wake up tomorrow morning in another country. And suddenly the story, which I had been kind of interested in that it seemed kind of human interesty seemed like it was actually much bigger than the story that, I'd, that, that I had originally thought because this family was kind of symbolic of the, the, one of the last families that we get into our country, that their arrival had marked this kind of tectonic shift in politics, both domestically, but geopolitically in terms of who refugees were gonna get in um, and that they were coming to this new world, but it was a new world for all of us now that Donald Trump is gonna become president. So needless to say, I was really starting to think like, oh my gosh, what if this family, will they talk to me? Uh, because the plan had been like, wait, see if they'll talk, if not repeat until you find a family. But their arrival on this day kind of turned it into like, I couldn't replicate that. So I knew that I needed a translator. So I, um, I called up a friend of mine named Mohammed Hafez. Uh, this is a great New Haven story. Everyone is, is New Haven based here. And Mohammed Hafez um, is a local architect and also an artist. He's made these incredible installations that are models of, um, war-torn Syria, he's got national recognition for it. Um, he's also just a good guy. And I called up Muhammad and I said, would you be willing to be my translator to go with me to meet this family and kind of help make the pitch that they should participate? And I knew enough to know that like one Arabic speaker was not just interchangeable with another. I needed a Syrian here to kind of bridge the, the, the cultural divide. And Muhammad said to me pretty bluntly, he said like, I, I, Jake, I'm gonna be honest with you. I, I appreciate what you're trying to do. I applaud your efforts, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think this is gonna work. And then he enumerated a series of very reasonable explanations for why it wouldn't work. He said, you do not speak Arabic. You are not Syrian. You are not Muslim. You're a Jewish guy from Buffalo um, and so on and so forth. And then he said, you know, look, I work with Syrian refugees in New Haven, and I am all those things. And it still sometimes takes me as much as two years for these families to open up. So I don't think it's realistic that you're gonna show up there and they're gonna pour out their souls to you and let you follow them around for God knows how long. And I mean, he, he got me pretty pessimistic about the prospects of this working, but I did say, will you just go with me? <laughs> Humor me, if you will. And um, he said, of course, of course I'll go with you. So we showed up, there were two brothers that arrived uh, in this family. One was Isa uh, Aldaban. He lives out uh, in, or lived out in, in Westville in New Haven. The other brother, Ibrahim, lived out in Hartford. And we went to the local brother, the one in New Haven first, Isa. We showed up at his house. Of course, I had a gift. You know, you have to show up with a gift. And um, right off the bat, 
it was kind of fortuitous because Muhammad Hafez, my translator, and Isa just started talking. I had brought the first Syrian that they had seen to their house since their arrival. And so I just kind of shut up and let them talk because they were just so glad to see one of their fellow countrymen. And they talked for a while. And then eventually Muhammad said, um, Muhammad Fez said, you know, let me explain who this guy is over here pointing at me. And he starts to explain that I'm this journalist and I have this idea about doing a graphic narrative. I had brought a copy of a book called Persepolis, uh, which is a graphic memoir as an example, because it's kind of a weird thing, a true comic, what, you know, um, there's not a lot of that that's done. And so he's just kind of nodding his head, nodding his head and says to Muhammad, like, so this is the guy, so, so th this, he wants to tell my story. And he, he then kind of shooed his two kids out of the room and totally unprompted started to tell the story of the day that he was abducted back in Syria by Assad's henchmen and detained for quite, it was, you know, they had these mass arrests for which the, much of the purpose of them was just to instill terror in the population. No one is safe. And he was rounded up in one of these mass arrests and he was then interrogated. And as part of this interrogation, they had him, they contorted his body um, so that he was hunched over and they squeezed him, his lower back. So it was like this into a car tire so that the lower back was protruding from the back of the car tire. And then they took out these wooden sticks and they beat the hell out of his lower back. They beat it so badly that they messed up the vertebrae. And, and to this day, when I met him, he was walking with a limp. So I was completely uh, not expecting this. Um, to tell me the story, I mean, often with refugees, the idea is, you know, steer clear of things that are going to trigger their trauma, etc. cetera. And, and he just launches into this. And it goes on for some time. And Muhammad is kind of translating, I say, um, Muhammad, does he intend, are we on the record here basically? Like, does he intend is for me to write about this in the Times? And Isa turned to Muhammad and said, if he can get the truth out there and the truth strikes a blow to the Assad regime, then I'm happy to do it. So I thought, okay. I think Muhammad was surprised, I was surprised. Um, I eventually went and met the other brother in Hartford um, and had a somewhat similar experience. They invited me into the house and just tremendous hospitality among the Syrians um, that I met at least. And um, they had a 15 year old boy there who sat next to me and kind of, his name was Naji. He becomes in the book that I end up writing, Naji ends up becoming the protagonist. Um, he has a whole other amazing story. Um, and I start talking to that family. And, um, you know, call back the times and say, I think this is a go. But I wasn't sure they totally got what I was going to do. So when the first installment was getting ready to run in the times, it was a 24 panel full page uh, spread. I brought it back to the family to to Issa's family to show them. As a journalist, you're never supposed to show copy to the people you're so-called copy to the people you're writing about because you're meant to have this barrier of separation between you and your subject. But I just felt like they've got to see what I'm doing. Um, it, first of all, it's so kind of uh, unusual to have this graphic narrative, but they're also like refugees. There's culture. There's a language barrier. Like basically, like rules be damned. They're going to look at this. And we all sat down on the floor of the house um, and Issa kind of reviewed it panel by panel by panel by panel by panel. And I'm, and I'm preparing myself, I'm telling myself, if he freaks out, I've got to be ready to walk away from this because I'm not strong arming with this refugee and telling this story publicly. So he's just looking at it, looking at it, looking at it. And then he points at a panel. It's the panel in which he was going to the airport back in Syria. And he says, the car in that panel, the car I went to the airport in was a 2011 Mitsubishi Lancer. That car is not a 2011 Mitsubishi Lancer. I turned to Muhammad. I said, 
is that it? <laughs> is that the extent of his corrections? Yes, that's the extent of it. And I just like huge sigh of relief. Uh, but there were other conversations that were trickier where he said to me, I remember early on, this is early on in the Trump administration. He said, we, we changed their names by the way, for the times. He said, is there any way that the Trump administration will in any way exact retribution on us for participating in this? And I was, the words no were like at the tip of my tongue. And then I paused for a second and I qualified it and I said, I don't think so. Um, because at that moment in particular in time, it was not clear where we were headed as a country. Um, and as it turns out, there wasn't. In fact, this narrative, and I ended up following this family for a year in the Times, and a lot happened. Um, the family out in Hartford, the one with Najee, the 16-year-old, they had a whole saga, which was that they received a very credible death threat in the small town where they were living that the FBI got involved in. And I ended up chronicling that narrative in real time each week or every other week in the Times. Um, but what the both families, I think, ended up realizing was um, was the fact that their story was being serialized almost like a, a TV show or, you know, the actually gave them um, a fair amount of agency because people started to, to kind of, in the school where the kids went to, it got out. This is the family from the New York Times. Even within Iris, um, I think there was a sense of like, we have to make sure this family is all right because everyone is watching. Um, and I think in the end, that ended up being something that the families realized was something that empowered them. And then I was very glad to see that it empowered them. But it was, there were a lot of moments that were, that were tricky and that were messy. And I remember when the family, Najee's family out in Hartford got the death threat. It was in February, there was a storm coming. It was like one of those, like all the weather. And I remember getting in the car and driving out and stopping at the supermarket and getting cartons of ice cream and whipped cream and hot fudge because they had like five kids and just wanted to bring something positive and just sat there with the family. And I remember feeling at that time that it was this kind of very fraught situation because from a storyteller's perspective, it was very rich because it was drama. I mean, uh, they had received a death threat and yet, I cared for this family. Um, you know, I'd gotten to know them at that point pretty well. And I was concerned for them. And that there's times, I was just talking about that this with my wife earlier today. There are times where your role as a person and as a fellow human being and your who wants to help and at your position as a storyteller are not always perfectly aligned. And we worked our way through it with this family. I spent four years with them chronicling their story um, for the book. The Times is only one year. And so I became like deeply enmeshed in their family uh, in ways that were um, messy. Um, but also in ways that were necessary to create the kind of intimacy that were required. And I'll tell you one story that will help you understand that and we can pause for questions, but the story that really ended up grabbing me and the story that became the basis for the book, Welcome to the New World, is the story of Naji, who's this, um, he's 10 years old when the Civil War starts in Syria. And um, I had very limited glimpses into Naji's life at first because his English wasn't very good. And because also um, when he arrived in the States, he was 14 or 15, but I also didn't feel comfortable just interviewing a 14 or 15 year old kid when I didn't really, you know, talk about consent issues. So I kind of stayed clear of him for a bit, but I knew there was something going on with him because when, before he got enrolled in school, his community sponsors would come over to the house and work with all the kids to get them prepped to go to school. And Najee wouldn't sit with them. He would always sit with the mom and dad to overhear what mom and dad were saying to these other community volunteers. And the community volunteers, the co-sponsors didn't understand it. They're like, 
why is Najee not sitting with the kids? Najee, you need to sit with the kids. And Najee told me relatively early on, Jake, they didn't understand that I wasn't a kid and I had stopped being a kid at the age of 10. So I knew that there was something that had happened to this young man that was possibly traumatic, pretty serious, that, that, had, that made him say that. And it was a, maybe two years into reporting, a year and a half into reporting that I really started to get to know Najee and he told me the story. And the story was is that his father, Ibrahim, like Isa, the other one I told you about who they tortured with that tire, Ibrahim was also taken in in one of these mass arrests. And when he, after he was taken, the neighborhood where Najee and his, Najee was 10 at the time, he was the oldest kid, their neighborhood descended into civil war. And bullet holes, craters in the walls, no food. And Naji had to go out onto the streets to look for food. He and his cousin would actually strip copper wire from dangling power lines. They didn't even know these lines, these, whether these lines were dead or alive. Um, and then they would sell the copper and then they would buy food. And they would, going through runes, jumping over dead bodies sometimes. Naji told a harrowing story about being on a bread queue at one point and gunfire breaking up, his sister was with him and the woman in line in front of him picked up his sister and tried to use his sister as a human shield to protect herself from the stray bullets that were flying across the street. So Naji though was the main person at 10 who had to provide and venture out in the streets to provide for the family in his father's absence. And that was the end of his childhood in many ways. The family, the father does get out of jail eventually and they flee to Jordan. And when they're in Jordan, Najee tries to go to school, but can't, he's, as a refugee, he's, he's targeted and bullied. And Najee starts petitioning his father in Jordan. We've got to go to America, we've got to go to America, we've got to go to America, it gets it in his head that if they can just get to America, they're gonna be okay. Anyway, um, eventually, uh, the family is got, gets the green light. They're vetted extensively. Like refugees aren't just admitted to our country. They're, they're, there's an incredible amount of vetting that occurs. And they're given the green light, and, but only part of Najee's family is given the green light. So his, one of his uncles and his grandmother, but some of the other uncles aren't there. And the grandmother, the matriarch of the family says, I'm not going unless everyone can go. And so Najee's dad now is in this really tough situation where his mother, grand, the grandmother family is saying, I'm not going unless everyone can go. Um, and Najee during this time is just pushing and pushing and pushing his father to come. And um, his father told me in one of these interviews, uh, Najee pushed me so much that at times I hated him. And I knew that this was a man who loved his father. I mean, this guy, he's crazy about his son. And I thought like, am I gonna really include that in the book? But it felt really important. So I went back with them and was almost like a kind of group therapy session. And I said, look, this is what your dad said. Najee, did you realize that this is the way your dad felt? And he said, yeah, I knew Jake that he felt that way, but I felt I had to push because we had no future here. And so I included it. And then I went back and fact checked it again with them because I just wanted to make sure that they knew that that was in there and that they felt comfortable with that. And they said, yeah, this is, this is the way it was. Um, this, is the, this is the truth of it. And I don't think they would have shared that with me if I hadn't basically been a fixture in their family for as long as I had. And I don't think I would have been so nervous about including it if I wasn't as close to them as I was. And so we had to navigate these kind of situations which were, you know, very tricky. And then of course, as I'll just wrap up, you know, the family comes to America and when they get the death threat, uh, Anaji's sister Amal turns to him and says, are you happy? Is this the great America you were telling us about that we had to come here for? And Najee said, kind of amazingly for a teenager said, she was right. Like I owned it. There was nothing I could say to her. And when I heard that, then I really knew that the, the, the story that this wanted to be was a coming of age story. It was Najee's story. 
you know, I get the goosebumps just kind of retelling it. Um, it's the story of this kid whose childhood ends abruptly at age 10 and is in search of like some way to normalize his life and sees America as what's going to do it. And then gets here at this moment in history where America turns on a dime and Trump becomes president. And then this plays out in a more hostile way for the place in which they've landed. And how do you make sense of that? And how do you heal your family? And how do you find your footing in this new place? And that becomes the basis of the book. Um, so I've given you kind of a lengthy, you know, kind of spiel on all of this. Um, hopefully enough that even if you haven't read the book or read the series in the Times, you can understand the stakes and the scope of the story. Um, I'm happy to talk more. I'm also happy to answer questions if there are any at this point. So thanks again, Jake, for coming. Um, before we get into um, our own questions that we've prepared, if anyone has any questions, please um, add them to the chat or the Q&A if you want to ask something anonymously on Zoom. And if you're on Facebook, you can just put it right in the comments and it should feed into our chat. Um, one question I had for you, Jake, and, and I'm someone who reads a lot of graphic novels, um, both like, you know, the traditional superhero stuff and fiction, um, but also like I read Persepolis um, and uh, George Takei has a graphic memoir. Um, something that set your book apart and you kind of touched on this is that it's more, um, it started as a piece of journalism. So it's not a memoir. Um, so you mentioned in the, in the end of the book about your pro writing process, how um, it had to undergo fact checking and everything that it would, if it were just uh, an article, did that slow your writing process down or did that uh, like affect it in, in any way? Um, you mean, so are we talking about your, my process when it, when I was working for the times and doing the series for the times or my, or how did it affect my process when I was writing the book or both? Kind of both. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. Um, you know, I think that I was aware of a few things. I was aware that, you know, first of all, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> I had never done this before. And um, so that, that was, that's one thing. Um, two, um, it was basically, it looked like a cartoon. So I, I realized that, you know, some people might not think that it was true or doubt that it was true. And then three, like there's a history of cartoons being used for propaganda. I mean, the Nazis did a very effective job with this during the Third Reich. Um, so um, I didn't want this to just be propaganda for what I perceived to be a good cause. Um, so I wanted it to be buttoned up, you know, and because it wasn't memoir, I had to check with other people so, you know, like when they received the death threat, I had to interview folks at the FBI. I had to talk to, you know, I went to, to school with them. I didn't just take Najee's experience in school and ask him about it. I went to school, I interviewed the teachers. I sat in the classroom as he was in class. I talked to his classmates. With Ibrahim, I went to his job training sessions with him. Um, you know, I went to Adiba, the mom's art shows um, and witnessed it and then you know, I would also like check with people on the ground in Syria about their description of what their life was like. I found someone in Syria who knew them, an American aid worker who knew them when they were living in Syria, I interviewed her. So I tried to bring like the appropriate degree of skepticism that a journalist has to bring to make sure that it was all accurate. Um, that's, yes, that slowed it down um, in some ways. Um, but also sometimes it leads to kind of interesting places. So I interviewed the co-sponsors at length um, and got their perspective uh, on, on the, and, and how like stressed they were that like Iris expected them to get this family to be completely self-sufficient in four months. And they were just stressed beyond their belief that there was no way that they could do this. I don't know that I would have done that and talked to them if I didn't feel that I had to fact check everything. So it slowed it down in some ways, but it also opened up narratives in other ways. So you mentioned 
all the time you spent with his family and it seems like you developed quite a, an intimate relationship with them. And I know in, at the end of the book, you kind of write like um, a little bit about uh, how they're doing since the book ended. Are you still in contact with them now too? Yeah, I just talked to Najee. Uh, let's see, what day did I do it? I was on the phone with him last week, this past Thursday. Um, one of the things that's been cool about this is that in the wake of the book coming out, Najee's become kind of a star. He's given lectures at Harvard and Yale and Stanford. Um, and we were doing actually a presentation at Stanford remotely and Najee was telling his story. Najee and his um, sister Amal both got full scholarships to UConn where they're gonna be going next year. Um, so yeah, I'm still, I'm still in touch with them, you know, whatever it is. I mean, we'll be approaching five years this November. So um, yeah, I um, there's a connection that I have with that family that's really um, that's deep, and they're they're doing well. Um, you know, they own a house; they bought a house, so it's kind of the American dream. One of the first things they did is hoist the American flag up over their doorstep. Um, one thing that was also really cool is that. Naji raised pigeons in Jordan. He couldn't go to school because he got bullied, but he found this pigeon and he raised these pigeons and kind of, he had to leave the pigeons behind. And so when they bought the house, the first thing that Naji did was he built a pigeon coop. Um, and it was kind of beautiful because I thought my take on it was that he was also reconnecting with a little bit of his boyhood because he's in the classic way that so many immigrant kids are, he, He's like, he's works, he works a lot of hours a week to help support the family and, his, and he's, he's his parents ambassador to the world in many ways. So, and he does it, he does it uncomplainingly. Um, he has a level of resilience that's, that's unbelievable. Um, he's so positive. It's incredible. People often say, oh, it's depressing to write about refugees. Do you find it depressing to write about refugees? And quite the opposite. Um, Naji shows a level of resilience that's, that, that, that is, you know, kind of miraculous to me. Did you have, I don't, I don't want to cut off Haley if she has any, <laughs> any questions. Um, so let me just see, I had written, written some notes out. I, I found it really significant, like when that family arrived. So it's, it's very lucky that they did agree to do this. Um, because that just makes you know, the storytelling so much more um, meaningful. Uh, do you know, first, did the grandma ever come to America? Like, are the rest of the family here? No, the grandma is not in America yet. I mean, I think that now that there's a new, um, you know, administration, a Biden administration, there is a chance that she will come. But so far, she's not, you know, that this, uh, they're, they remain kind of a fractured extended family in a way that I think is really difficult. And in fact, um, my translator, uh, Mohammed Afez didn't end up being my translator for the whole series. I got paired up with this young man named Mohammed Kadala, who was at the time a, a graduate student at UConn. Um, and he's just an amazing guy, amazing. So thoughtful and sweet and he, he really kind of made the project happen in many ways. And um, anyway, so um, Muhammad had his own, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Kadala, he had his own story. He'd come to America just before the Syrian civil war broke out and kind of couldn't go home. And he, when I was working on this project, hadn't seen his parents in like seven or eight years. Um, and then his father passed. You know, um, so I think that that's a thing about these story about these 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 people that come here. I mean, they there's such a cost. You know, it's like there's this narrative that's out there sometimes about oh they're just coming to America and getting what they can get. And I want you to th think for a second about what it would take for you to leave your home, leave everyone you know, leave your job, leave all your possessions and leave your parents with the prospect of never seeing them again. How bad would it have to be 
And how much hope and drive would you have to have about the place that you're coming to in order for that to happen? Just tremendous, you know? Um, and so, yeah, these separations are, are powerful and it's not been, they've not been reunified. What was it, it like for you winning that Pulitzer? For, where, I'm sure you weren't expecting that from like a comic strip, but this is yeah such a um, unique project. Like <laughs> Yeah, um, it's kind of a great story to be honest. Um, I, I had, let's see, I had been told my editor, Bruce had them at the times. He, um, he told me that the prize, he called me up the week before and he said, uh, they will be announced on a, on a Monday. He said, but the times finds out on the Friday beforehand, because they have to be able to call their foreign correspondents back. Um, and they need like two days heads up. So he said, sure, we'll know by the end of business on Friday. And it, it, this was, and I, it was a long shot, but we, I knew that, that, it was, that, the, that we had put in an entry for it. So it was possible. It was like buying a lottery ticket, basically. Um, and so my family and, and, and me, my wife and my two young boys, we were going to Spain on vacation on that Friday. And we had a flight that was boarding at like 5.15, I think. So I thought, okay, by the time I get on the plane, we'll know. And so I was, you know, all day <laughs> waiting for maybe a call, but it also seemed like a delusion of grandeur. And then five came and, and went and there was no call. So I, I just thought, okay, well, you know. And then it was, the plane was boarding and it was 5.15 and the phone rang and I saw the caller ID was New York Times. And I write for them from time to time. So that's, it could be, so... I pick, pick up and uh, the editor says, Jake, it's Jim Dow, who was at the time an editor at the, at the uh, opinion section where I was writing for. And I said, hey, <laughs> and uh, you know, meanwhile, we're, we're, we're being funneled onto the jetway to get on the plane. And he says, um, Jake, I have some really incredible news. You and, you and Michael have just won the Pulitzer Prize. And um, it was shock. And, um, and I, I was overcome with emotion I, I, that I wasn't even really expecting. I had worked as a freelancer. I was at that point, you know, in my early forties and I, I had worked in as a freelancer for 20 years. And there were many, many years where it was thin and where you inevitably asked the question, why am I doing this? And is this really feasible? And can I make a living? And can I support my kids? And, and I have no job security and I have no health insurance. And, and, I, and you kind of just go on faith that something will work out, you know? And then this was this project that had been this incredibly meaningful journey that I had taken with this family. And then to get this news and my wife, I must have teared up because my wife thought someone died and she said, what's wrong? And I said, um, I won the Pulitzer and uh, my kids hugged me and um, it was just one of those moments you never forget. You know, it was so great to have my kids there with me and my wife. Um, and then I called up the families. I got, I got again, the plane went to Spain and um, I called my mother, of course, and then I called Ibrahim and uh, Adis, uh, Ibrahim and Isa, the two brothers from Spain, and I, I told them the news, and um, I also told them that I was going to split the prize money with them, which I did. We split it three ways, um, and um, it was just um, these things shouldn't always matter. These shiny stickers that people award you in life, but sometimes they do. Um, and, and this was definitely one where they did. That's really um, beautiful that you shared that money with them. It felt like the only right thing to do. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that you can tell from what I've said today that from the very beginning, I was concerned about not wanting this to be exploitative and wanting this to feel like this was something that we were doing together and that we were as much as possible within the parameters partners on this. Um, 
it's something that it's hard. Sometimes as a journalist, I've been in situations where I think it doesn't always feel like that. And it's, it doesn't sit right with you. And I feel like this was one where I was determined to do everything in my power to feel that like this was something that we were going to do together. And if there was anything to be gained from it, we would gain it together. Um, that was my, that was my, my sincere hope. And I think that to a great extent, it's been realized. So when you were writing this for the times, at what point did it sort of become, uh, I should put this in graphic novel form or how, how did that end up happening? Yeah, so I think that the thing about the times that was, that was it was great to have it in the times each week. And the first episode was a 24 panel, which you can do a lot with 24 panels. But after that, it was eight panels every week. And it's very hard to, to, to tell story. I mean, it's actually, it's a great lesson in storytelling of how to tell a story in eight panels because you really have to boil the story down to its kind of uh, essentials, but it's also limiting. And I think that I started to sense that like, if we had more room, we could do this um, properly. And I think around that time, I was also starting to know more about Naji and his story and feeling that like, hmm, maybe this is the way to go. And we, you know, and that maybe kind of you reframe the whole narrative with Naji at the center. Um, and so I think that those thoughts kind of, and I was, and I like, and I love the project. I thought it was an important and meaningful project. Um, and I thought that like, um, so I started, we started casting about for a book uh, and we had one editor, Reva Hockerman, who was our editor. And she'd actually contacted the Times to inquire about um, us doing this as a book, independently of this. So that seemed like, that, that, that enthusiasm seemed great. Um, so um, anyway, that's how, that's how that came to be. I have a question. Um, so the story starts, um, at least in the, in the book version, um, after they've already left Syria and they're in Jordan, figuring out whether they're gonna get to America or not. And then sort of in the middle, you have like a flashback chapter that actually shows what happened to them during the Civil War. Um, how did you decide to, to tell that out of order? Um, it's a great question. It's, it's, it's a great question. And, and, all, and so um, when, when, when storytelling, when engaging in storytelling, chronology, straight chronology is always the easiest um, structure because it's intuitive, it flows. One thing, it's the way history plays out. One thing happens and then another. You, you kind of just, it's like when you tell a story, what happened to you last night? You know, you usually start at the, you, you don't have flashbacks. You tell the story as it happened. So I, one of the things I thought I was gonna do with the book was that I was gonna start the story in Syria. And Reba, my editor said, no, definitely don't. She said, you need to show them basically, it needs to start with the arrival in America because that's kind of the real the kind of hook that they arrive on election day. But also she said, you wanna humanize them. That if you see them in this war-torn context of desperate jumping over bodies and, you know, and, and the like, it's gonna seem somehow like you can't relate to it. It's not human. It's, it's just like more carnage that you see, but, if you get to know them first and you buy into them as people that are people kind of like you and me is, you know, the cliche or whatever, then when the, the, the terror happens, you will feel it because you have first known them as humans and then seen their life devolve into something terrible and you'll feel that descent. And when she said it, it was like, I, I immediately knew she was right. And it was not my idea, it was entirely her idea. Um, and so, and also it's a bit of the mystery too, which is like, remember when I told you the story that Najee told me, um, I'm not a kid, Jake. And I stopped being a kid when I was 10. And so it's kind of like, huh, 
what happened to him? And so when they're in America and their co-sponsors are hearing this, they don't know what's happened. So it's a bit of a mystery too, which is that when we meet these people, when the co-sponsors meet these people and they arrive here, we don't know what's happened to them. But when we learned out what's happened to them, then it fills in the place. So all these things kind of argued for, um, for, for telling that part of the story in flashback. It worked out really well. Like before you came on, uh, Haley and I were talking about um, the book and like how heavy certain parts were, especially that it was so impactful um, and that it kind of had us crying and we weren't used to crying while watching, like, you know, reading a graphic novel. Um, so that was definitely an, an interesting and, and smart choice to make. Uh, did, did anything, um, the, the book, um, do you think the story is reaching a wider audience or, or a different audience in the form of a graphic novel than, a, than it would have as a regular book? I hoped that the answer would be yes. I mean, I think that one limitation from the Times is that the people that read the Times are the people that are, you know, it's self-selecting. It's like Fox News. It's like we all, we all box off into our separate little chambers and get the news that we want to hear in some ways or that, or that even if we don't want to hear, it's sometimes the news that confirms our own worldview. And so I didn't really ever know how many people were reading my thing in the Times and, and, and feeling like it was changing any hearts and minds. I was hoping that the book, which kind of was billed as a YA book in part, would, um, would have just a wider reach that would be in, in school libraries. I got to tell you, I had one incident. I had one incident that makes me wonder whether that's the case. Though I, um, I had written a series of of young adult books. In fact, I've been to the Mitchell Library before um, with Sharon um, to, to 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 go to do these, and um, the Dormia series. And so I've traveled widely around the country um, and um, gone to schools. I mean, probably like two hundred schools. Maybe I've been to in. in so when this book came out, I reached out to many of those schools and said, hey, I've got this new book out. Do you want? So there was a school in Missouri that I had been to at least, I think, twice. And they knew me, you know, and, and it, so I reached out and they said, OK, yeah, we'll, we'll book you. You're going to come. Um, it was a virtual visit. And so then um, like a week or two before the visit, she canceled. The librarian canceled. And she wrote an email and she said, in this hot political climate, this is like maybe like, I don't know, uh, a month after the election, two months after the election. Um, I don't think that we can have this book at our school right now. We still have a lot of parents out there who think the election was stolen and this and that. So I wrote back and I was just like, as, as, as kind of, calmly and as even handedly as I could and said, there's very little about American politics in this, in this book. I mean, even the pictures of Donald Trump, the drawings of Donald Trump that we have in the book, we went to great pains to make those as kind of neutral looking, even as friendly looking as we could. There's no like kind of angry Donald Trump faces. The one time that he appears in the news, it's actually kind of like a very kind of genteel Donald Trump. Um, there's, it's just a story of some, some refugees that happened to arrive when he was president and what that meant for them. And they didn't want that at their school. Um, and it was just like, it was depressing. Um, and I wrote, and I wrote this impassioned e email to them. I mean, I was, I did my very best to not be the kind of judgy, liberal or whatever, you know, I said, look, I've been to your school. You got a great school. I've been there twice. I've sold books. I've met your students. Your students are great. Um, I'm not going to delve into politics. I'm not going to be, I'm just going to be talking about a 15 year old boy's story. Okay. I said, I'm going to be talking about what his life was like. That's it. And she said, I brought up my principal my principal backs me up. We can't, we, and what was so sad about it was when she kept back to me, she said, um, we can't risk upsetting, it was the parents. It was, the, they, they didn't want to, 
they were scared of the backlash against the, from the parents. See, the kids would be fine. The kids can handle it. Uh, it's the parents that, that, that um, would mess it up, you know? So I don't know uh, that. I mean, I think so. I don't know how many, um, I do think, I look, I, I feel hopeful and certain that there's some, but the people that pick this up and, and have a different view on it. But um, I think that we live in times where people um, turn off when they think they're gonna hear something that they don't wanna hear. Mm. Well, I'm hopeful that, that the book kind of changes, changes that and people are more open, maybe because it's in a different format to at yeah. least, um, you know, hearing it out. Um, we're, we're nearing the end of the hour. We do have one question in the chat. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the political situation in Syria today? Um, the fallout from the war and refugee crisis must be massive. Yeah, so uh, let me just preface this by saying that um, I'm not super on top of the, 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 the up to the minute uh, news in Syria, but I mean, I think that, um, you know, Assad has won. Um, you know, uh, whatever hopes there were from the Arab Spring spreading to Syria, you know, um, you know, when you talk to people like the Aldabans about why the uprising occurred, why the protests occurred, you know, they, they'll tell you that corruption was rampant, um, that um, there was a drought that was intensifying the situation, um, and that there was no transparency within the government, that Assad was arresting people, even, even teenage kids, um, and so, but that re rebellion such that it, it was, is, I think pretty firmly been crushed. Um, and I think that Assad is, is firmly in power. Um, and I think a lot of people who left like the Aldabans wouldn't feel safe returning under those circumstances. And so um, I think the devastation is massive. Um, the Aldabans, I, got a video that showed the destroyed remains of their own home. And um, I think that for the time being, the situation is, is, is pretty bleak there. Um, I think that, look, that the, it is true that with all these refugee issues on some level, there is a limit to how many people we can take in this country. And in some level, like we do need to try to create address the problem at its you know, base so that people feel that they don't have to come here. Um, and that's very complicated. That's extremely complicated. How do you do that? Um, but the situation in Syria, yeah, um, a devastated country that is gonna be rebuilding for probably decades. Well, I have one last question that is a little bit silly. Um, did you ever consider having a scene where the family meets a journalist who wants to write a comic about them? Yeah, and in fact, in the very uh, when we were trying to convince the Times to get on board, Michael Sloan. By the way, I haven't really talked about Michael, but Michael Sloan, my illustrator, he deserves so much of the credit for the success of this. His his drawings um, are were so beautiful and brought such humanity um, to the, the family. And Michael did such an amazing job of researching the way that Syria looked to kind of get it all just right. I mean, he worked tirelessly, um, honestly, like perhaps even the lion's share of the credit for this should go to Michael. He, he did an amazing job. Um, but in one of the original uh, mock-ups that, that Michael created, he had me meeting the family um, but I think in the end, the idea, the feeling was, is that I didn't want to get in the way of the story. Of course, my presence there changed the story and I am the filter through which it gets told. But I think that, um, there was this kind of old idea that like, get out of the way, you know, don't block the camera lens, just let the story be told. And so... I heeded that old advice in, as best I could. So this has been a great conversation. I'm really glad you were able to join us, Jake. Um, I just have a couple like housekeeping things and then we can wrap this up. T today's event was made possible by gifts, the New Haven Free Public Library Foundation. If you enjoyed this program, 
please consider making a donation at nhfpl.org slash donate um, to help support our collections, our programs, and our services throughout the year, um, especially if you're a fan of Jake. I know, Jake, you have a good relationship with Mitchell Library, and um, we're, we're facing probably, uh, possibly having to close that. So if, if you uh, did enjoy this and you want to make a donation, please feel free to do that. Um, next week, I will be chatting with nutrition and fitness expert Michelle Vadraska about meal prep and healthy eating for books and barbells program, which is similar to this, but fitness centered. And then please join us next Thursday for another book sandwiched in. We will chat with Kate Washington about her new book, Already Toast, Caregiving and Burnout in the US. And I just wanted to say um, big thanks to Haley for, for co-hosting this one with me and um, our colleague Isaac, who is behind the scenes right now handling the technology um, and who's a big part of coordinating this event for the library. Um, and thank you uh, a million times over, Jake, for coming. This has been such an amazing chat and, and it was so great. Um, uh, my 